Chapter One. Excuse me, which way to the gymnasium? Kelly pushed her hair out of her face with her mitted hand. Her hat slipped, and she tried to catch it as it fell. Down the hall and to the right. The teacher finished tying a little boy's shoe and handed her hat back to her from his kneeling position. Kelly blinked in surprise. He was incredibly hot for a nerdy teacher a type. With dark blonde hair, thin wired glasses, and preppy clothes, he really had something going for him. Maybe it was the gray eyes. She shot him a smile. Thanks. You're welcome. He gave her a hesitant smile in return. Come on, Bentley. Kelly pulled her son after her, following Mr. Cute Teacher's directions. She hoped he was Bentley's teacher. She could start looking forward to parent-teacher conferences then. Kelly jogged the last steps and then skidded to a halt at the doors of the gym. It was nearly deserted. There was a small group of women around a table, but no one else was to be seen. Excuse me? Kelly walked over to the ladies. Is this where we are supposed to register? They looked so poised, and they wore very nice clothes. Kelly knew she was out of her league, but she straightened up and smiled at them. They forced smiles to their faces as they looked at her. The blonde in the middle broadened her fake smile a little further. You're late. I'm sorry, but the bus doesn't extend all the way out here? We ended up walking quite a piece, Kelly explained. She dug in her purse and held out several forms. I brought everything Bentley needs. Perfectly manicured hands took the papers. Where are your parents? Kelly stiffened. She was joking, right? Pardon? Your parents? You can't register yourself or your brother. The blonde raised a plucked eyebrow. Kelly bet she was Botoxed on a regular basis. That eyebrow had barely moved. Kelly strained her shoulders and said firmly, I'm Bentley's mother. I'm Mrs. Islington. Kelly knew that she looked a lot younger than her 29 years. If she didn't have a driver's license and the age of majority card to prove it, she wouldn't believe it herself. However, good genetics, a short stature, and dimples conspired against her. Most people pegged her for a teenager, and depending on the day, they guessed from 14 to 17. It was embarrassing and frustrating. The blonde tittered, and so did her group of lackeys. How very funny. Really, now? Please inform your mother that she'll need to register Bentley and you to Livingston Academy. Until then, I can't help you. Kelly took the paperwork back that she had spent her breaks at work filling in yesterday and fake smiled. Could I have your name, please? Susan Hythe, the blonde replied. Thank you. Kelly smiled sweetly and marched out of the gymnasium, holding on to Bentley's hand firmly. Mom, I don't feel very good, Bentley said morosely. Kelly sighed and stopped, facing her son. Bent, we talked about this. It's natural to feel a little nervous about starting at a new school, but some of your friends will be here too. Anyone who lived near us, like Charlie or Ryan, should be in your class. You'll be fine, okay? He nodded. Okay. Kelly straightened. He was only in second grade, but he was growing too fast for her. She ruffled his hair and he tried to duck away from her. Which way do you think the office would be? Bentley shrugged and scuffed his shoe against the floor, leaving a black mark. She'd forgotten to get his indoor shoes from first elementary. Maybe she would manage it at some point this week if her schedule allowed for it. Kelly sighed and saw Mr. Too Cute Teacher walking through the hall. Excuse me? He turned to look at her and she hurried to catch up to him. Hi, do you know where the office is? I was just headed that way. He smiled at her and Kelly's heart skipped a beep. Who is this young man? This is Bentley. He was attending first elementary, she explained unnecessarily. Ah, he said knowingly. What's that supposed to mean? Kelly frowned. Nothing, he shrugged, a little wary of her tone. I meant nothing by that. Just because one set of vandals decided to cherry bomb all the toilets in the school does not mean the entire student body are criminals. Kelly hotly defended her son's school. Just because he was cute didn't mean he could insult her son and the other first elementary students who had been transferred to Livingston Academy for the duration of the repairs. I didn't say it did, he remarked mildly. Well, Bentley is a good boy, Kelly huffed. I'm sure he is, Mr. Cute Teacher said. Don't worry, I'm sure the board will get the first elementary fixed soon, and all of your students will be safe from our fleas soon enough, 
She marched into the office. Who said anything about fleas? He wondered, following her into the office. Some posh woman in the parking lot. Kelly scowled at him before beaming a smile at the secretary. She put Bentley's paperwork on the countertop. Excuse me, I've had a misunderstanding trying to register Bentley for school. Mrs. Hythe sent me here. Perhaps you could help me. The secretary looked Kelly over. We don't allow siblings to register each other. You'll need to get your parents to come to the school. Kelly felt like she could scream. Instead, she put her hands on Bentley's shoulders and stirred firmly behind him. My name is Kelly Islington. This is my son, Bentley, whom I'm supposed to register this morning, preferably before my shift at work starts. If you can't help me, then I suggest you get the principal immediately. I need to see some identification, the woman said. Kelly pulled her wallet out of her purse. She set her hospital pass and her age of majority guard on the counter. Driver's license? The secretary asked as she perused the cards. I don't have one, Kelly replied. You expect me to believe this? The secretary held up the age of majority guard. What do you mean? Kelly's voice became a little brittle. This would make you... Her voice trailed off as she tried to calculate Kelly's birth date from the current date. Twenty-nine, Kelly flatly replied. Yes. The secretary gave her a look of disbelief. Please take a seat and I'll speak to the principal. Kelly gave her a tight smile. Thank you. Why did some silly kids have to pull such a stunt as blowing up toilets? Kelly took Bentley to the hard wooden bench and they sat down. At least at first elementary, they knew her, and dealing with Bentley's teachers hadn't been any problem. Kelly looked at her cell phone. She hoped this wouldn't take long. She couldn't afford to be late for work again. She noticed a message and opened her snapshots to find a picture of Michael and his daughter Amy on it. She sighed and closed the app. Now was not the time to be replying. Kelly tried to ignore Mr. Too Cute Teacher sitting beside her. Just because he was cute didn't mean he was very nice. Mr. Ramsley, a pleasure to see you again. A man came out of the side office, greeting Mr. Too Cute. Kelly frowned as the two men shook hands, and Mr. Too Cute was led into the side office, which had the plaque principal on the door. He didn't look like the Ramsleys Kelly knew. Now she'd wish she'd managed to get a quick picture of him and Snapchatted it to Michael. Surely Michael Ramsley would know who he was. How was that fair either? This Ramsley guy had come into the office after her and was now ensconced in the principal's office, talking about who knew what, while Bentley had to miss even more of the morning classes. Kelly tried not to grind her teeth. Bentley, if you're hot, you can take off your coat, Kelly suggested as she divested herself of her own winter coat, scarf, hat, and mitts. Her scrubs looked a little out of place in the office, but since she was going directly to work after Bentley was registered, they were what she had on. Bentley shrugged and leaned against her. She helped him out of his coat and rubbed his back, checking her cell phone for the time again. She was going to be late. "'Excuse me,' Kelly called out to the secretary. "'Is there any way we can hurry this up? I have to get to work.' "'I'm sorry. Principal Weston is currently busy.' The secretary gave her an insincere smile before going back to her typing. Kelly bit the inside of her cheek to prevent herself from saying anything uncharitable. She didn't want to set a bad example for her son. Twenty minutes later, she phoned Dana. How bad is it? Sandra spotted that you weren't here right away. I told her you were in the washroom with cramps, but I think she knows, Dana whispered. Where are you? Still at the school? Kelly frowned. You shouldn't have lied for me. I don't want you to get in trouble, too. I'll be fine. Just get here. Dana's voice became cajoling. Mr. Milton, if you would just take your pills, I can get you your breakfast. Thanks, Dana. Kelly ended the call before her friend could be caught talking on a cell phone at work. She looked calculating at the secretary. Do you know how long it's going to be? I'm sorry, the woman shrugged. Okay. Kelly stood up. Why don't you give me back Bentley's paperwork and my identification? I'll bring Bentley to the sitter today and we'll be back tomorrow to deal with this. The secretary looked at Kelly. I'm sorry, I can't do that. Excuse me? Kelly frowned. I'm not going to give you back your fake ID, she said firmly. You're kidding. Kelly couldn't believe the woman. I'm not, she stated. The principal will deal with this. 
That is my legal ID. Give it back. Kelly felt like yelling, but she restrained herself. She was Bentley's role model. No, the secretary said smugly. That's it. Kelly hopped up, leaning her upper torso on the counter, and swiped Bentley's paperwork with her IDs. She shoved them into her purse. Hey! The secretary got up and came around the counter, arms flailing. You can't do that! Kelly grabbed Bentley's coat. Get dressed, Bent. We're leaving. Mom, I really don't feel good, her son said as he got reluctantly to his feet. I know, you've said that already. Kelly held up his coat. Come on, I'm late for work. Give me back those papers, the secretary demanded. What is going on here? A new voice said. Kelly looked up to see the principal and Mr. Ramsley standing in the doorway behind him. She stole paperwork, the secretary accused. My son's paperwork and my IDs, which you refuse to give back, Kelly said hotly. The argument came to an abrupt halt as Bentley threw up, most of it hitting Kelly squarely in the abdomen. Kelly felt it seep into her clothes as it dripped downwards. Oh, Bent. I told you I didn't feel good, he said miserably as he wiped his mouth. Kelly nodded. I'm sorry I didn't listen better to you. She carefully tossed her clean coat onto the bench. Miraculously, her son had managed to stay clean. If he's sick, he needs to go home, the secretary stated scathingly. I have had it with this school. Kelly rolled up her top and managed to get it over her head without getting vomit on her face or in her hair. She threw the scrub top on the floor. Fortunately, she wore a long-sleeved shirt underneath. I have never met such a bunch of stuck-up, unhelpful, unfriendly people. She furiously grabbed their winter gear in one hand and Bentley's hand in the other. Snobs! Rude! How dare you? I don't know where I'm going to find another school for Bentley, but I will find one where they put the child first. Kelly marched out of the office, Bentley following her. Her cheeks were flaming. She was angrier than she'd been in a long time. Where are we going? Bentley asked. We're going to Grammy's house. She'll have to look after you while I go to work, Kelly grimaced. She was still wet on her long-sleeved shirt and smelled like vomit. She hoped her spare set of scrubs in her locker at work were clean. I don't want to go to Grammy's house, Bentley whined. Kelly really didn't want him to go there either, but her mother would look after him for free. You get the day off of school with Grammy. You can sleep all day and watch cartoons. Maybe even play video games with your Uncle Josh when he gets home from school. Bentley brightened at the thought. Kelly helped him on with his coat and hat. It was going to be a long walk to the bus stop. Excuse me, Mrs. Islington, a hesitant voice asked. Yes? Kelly looked up to see Mr. Ramsley looking down at her. He extended a hand in greeting. Dylan Ramsley, would you like me to call you a cab? She couldn't afford a cab. She hesitantly shook his hand. Kelly Islington, thank you, but Bentley and I will walk to the bus stop. He frowned. It's a bit far and you have a sick child. Would you like me to give you a ride? Get in the car with a complete stranger? She might think he was cute and liked his voice, but Kelly wasn't about to give her son bad examples to follow. Thank you, but no. She smiled to soften the rejection. He really was handsome. I'm sorry for what happened earlier today. Normally Livingston Academy staff were very welcoming and helpful. His warm gray eyes looked a little troubled. Well, I guess I came on the wrong day. Kelly tried not to grimace. I'm sorry, but I'm really late for work. Of course, he nodded. Kelly gave him one last forced smile before hurrying Beltonly down the long lane toward the road. She was super late. Sandra was certain to know that she hadn't made it on time, no matter how Dana had tried to cover for her. Kelly braced herself as she came out of the staff room, having changed into clean scrubs. She hurried to the nurse's station to look at the schedule. "'We've all pitched in, but you need to get yourself together,' Cheryl said. "'Sandra knows you're not here and wants to speak to you right away.' "'I'm sorry,' Kelly apologized. "'I was at the new school.' "'Don't tell me about it.' Cheryl put up a hand as she signed off on paperwork. I love you, Kelly, and I know how hard it is to be a single mom. However, you have a job to do. I know, Kelly sighed. I'm trying. Try harder. Cheryl pursed her lips and left to see a patient. Kelly sighed. 
Mentally preparing herself, she went to Sandra's office and knocked on the door. Sandra motioned her in. She leaned back in her chair and watched as Kelly took a seat. "'I'm very sorry,' Kelly said. "'I was at Bentley's new school, and there was a problem registering him. "'Then he was sick, and I had to take him to my mom's. "'I'll make up my hours during breaks.' "'Kelly, I have your employee file here.' "'She motioned to the pages on her desk. "'You have too many days where you come in late or have to leave early.' "'I'm a single mom,' Kelly tried to reason with Sandra. "'It's not easy. "'I'm trying really hard, though, and I'm a good employee.' You might be a good employee, but I need team players. You're letting the other nurses pick up your slack. If that's not being a team player, Sandra frowned. I have decided to put you on notice. On notice? What does that mean? Kelly felt a little panicky. She needed to keep her job. One more late, one more leaving early, one mistake, and I'm going to have to let you go. Sandra closed Kelly's file with a finality on the discussion. You can go back to work now. Kelly continued to sit in her chair. Is there anything I can do? I really need to keep my position here. Honestly, Kelly? Sandra asked. Kelly nodded. I'm really not holding out much hope for you. Sandra opened a file drawer and put the file away. Now please go back to work. Kelly felt let down at Sandra's bluntness. She had always tried her best at work. She thought she was a very good nurse, but she also knew that Sandra didn't really care about that. Sandra cared about having everyone follow the rules. There was no point in arguing with her boss. Kelly sighed and returned to the nurse's station to take over her patients for the day. She was scheduled to work eight hours in the ward and then the rest of her shift in the emergency room. Dana grabbed her. Have you been to see Sandra yet? Dana asked. Yep, it was painful as always, Kelly said grimly. She wasn't about to let Dana know how bad it really was. She didn't need it spread all over the hospital that she was about to get canned. Realistically, she knew that it was unlikely that she would never not be late again. That meant that she needed to start job shopping now. However, the job market wasn't exactly great at the moment. Nor was she likely to get such a plum spot at a hospital again if she had a bad review from her current employer. She's not too pleased with me either, Dana rolled her eyes. Kelly sighed. I told you not to cover for me. I don't want you to get in any trouble. It's not any trouble. We're friends, Dana grinned. Thank you for trying, Kelly gave her a smile. Now I'd better get some work done. Eight hours later, found Kelly in the emergency department. She was tired, sore, and dirty from a child who had thrown his entire lunch tray at her. Considering her other scrubs had puke smell, she'd wiped off the lunch as best as she could and continued working. I'm sure the doctor will be with you just as soon as he can, Mrs. Whittle. Kelly forced herself to smile and stay upbeat. As you can see, there's a lot of patients here and everyone needs attention. Mrs. Whittle gave an angry snort and crossed her arms. Kelly left while she could. She grabbed her next chart on the pile and headed to the next exam room. Hey, Tinkerbell, can I get some more gauze or something? A voice called out to her. Kelly stopped to see a guy sitting in one of the exam room beds, holding a blood-soaked pad to his eye. She grabbed a couple of sterile gods pads out of the supply cart and came over to see him. Max? Kelly asked. When did you get tattooed? Lady, I don't know who Max is. He pulled the pad away from his face to show a split eyebrow that was still bleeding. Taking the new gauze, he pressed it to the wound with a grimace. That's going to need stitches. Kelly cocked her head to look at him. Are you sure you're not related to Max Ramsley? You look just like him. I wouldn't know. He looked at her. When am I getting stitched up? Kelly had a feeling that she'd just been lied to. Once your wound has stopped bleeding so much, I'll clean it, and the doctor will stitch you up. Great, he muttered. Look, I have places to be. Is there any way you could just stick a bandage on it and I can leave? You've got a two-inch gash. It will scar, Kelly warned. I'm okay with that, he said. Let me check with the doctor in charge to see if that's okay, Kelly advised. I'll be back. She went to the nurse's station and grabbed her phone out of her pocket. Taking a quick look to make sure Sandra wasn't around, she surreptitiously snapped a photo of the guy in exam room six. Kelly sent the photo to Michael, along with a question mark. Michael Ramsley had been her patient when he had a couple of tumors removed from his brain. 
As a result of the surgery, Michael now had a condition called speech aphasia. He could no longer write, read, and had issues with speech. When Michael and his wife Anne came to the hospital for follow-up appointments, Kelly had hit on the idea of teaching him to Snapchat so he could communicate over the phone with friends and family. Now they were Snapchat buddies. Kelly loved that she got to see Michael, Anne, and their daughter Amy in pictures. Max Ramsley was Michael's brother. If anyone knew who the guy with the bleeding head wound in exam room 6 was, Michael should. Hey, the guy in 6, what's his name? Kelly asked the desk nurse Clarissa. Why, trying to get his number? She winked. He's a little short on charm, even if he's hot. I noticed. He wants to be bandaged up and sent home. Kelly smiled. What he really needs is stitches. Clarissa pulled the file. Andrew Colburn Ramsley. Kelly frowned. He'd said he wasn't related to Max Ramsley. Maybe he didn't know Max personally, but they both had the same last name in the same city. It was pretty likely they were related. Thanks. No problem, she smiled. Kelly continued to work her rounds. The hospital was packed with people, and it was slow going, getting through them all. Don't worry about it, Mr. Robbs. It happens all the time. Kelly smiled at the older gentleman and closed the privacy curtain. Hey, Tinkerbell, the familiar voice said. When am I getting out of here? Kelly jumped. He was right behind her. She turned and gave him a brilliant smile. Hi, hopefully after you've had your stitches. You should go back to the exam room. Andrew Colburn Ramsley looked down at her, unamused. I've been here for two hours. I can't wait any longer. Well, we've had a car accident and a few other more urgent cases, which have unfortunately bounced you back a little bit in the list of priorities, Kelly explained. Please just be patient and the doctors will see you as soon as he can. He rolled his eyes and turned away, answering his cell phone. Kelly shook her head and went back to the desk area. She looked at Clarissa. That Colburn Ramsley guy from exam six? Who's his nurse? He looks like he's going to be a runner. Let me check. Clarissa looked through her paperwork. He's Shelley's patient, but she just got off shift. Do you want him? Kelly rolled her eyes. Not really, but someone has to make sure he stays to get stitches. He's all yours, honey. She smiled and handed over a chart. Thanks. Kelly grabbed the paperwork and gave it a quick scan. She walked back to exam six to find the bed empty. There was also a lot of blood on the blankets. Kelly checked Shelley's notes again. All it said was the split eyebrow. She hadn't even cleaned the wound before she'd gone home. Kelly frowned and quickly scanned the emergency room. She didn't see him. Worry began to gnaw at her. She couldn't afford a missing patient. Kelly went back to see Clarissa. Have you seen him? Who? Clarissa was distracted by another chart being handed to her by one of the residents. Andrew Colburn Ramsley, the hottie from exam six? Kelly looked around the room again. He should easily stand out. He was over six feet, wearing a black tee and jeans with tattoos down his arms and dark hair. Nope, she typed at her computer. Call security. Kelly was feeling a little panic setting in. He might have left. Did Shelley say anything about him other than the gash through his eyebrow? Kelly, Clarissa frowned. I don't have time to read everyone's charts or talk about every patient. I understand, but I'm worried there's something more going on with him. Kelly knew it was policy to change bed linens between patients. Either he'd gone into the exam room before he was supposed to, or Andrew had more injuries than what Shelley had assessed. Please, Clarissa, just call security. Clarissa rolled her eyes. You know how many false alarms we get each week? He's probably in the washrooms. He's not here, Kelly insisted. I'm going to check the parking lot. You're not supposed to leave during your shift, Clarissa said as she picked up the phone, punching in the extension for security. Kelly ignored her as she walked out the automatic doors into the chilly evening. She rubbed her arms and looked around the dark parking area. She couldn't believe that Shelley had been so careless. Crossing the right of way for the ambulances, Kelly searched the row of cars. Finally, she had nearly exhausted the parking lot when she saw a dark figure on the ground by a motorcycle. Kelly grabbed her phone. Using the flashlight app, she could see that it was her patient. Tinker Bell, he grimaced. She crouched and grabbed the t-shirt on his back. It was soaked. She lifted it up to see multiple stab wounds. Why didn't you say anything? What? he asked, his voice slurring. Some punk got me in the face with a knife. Well, he got you in the back, too, Kelly stated. She knew he was in shock and wasn't going to be able to walk. 
Billy, he blinked. Huh. You didn't notice? she asked in disbelief. Kelly also couldn't believe that Shelley hadn't asked about any other injuries or documented them. She looked around. They were alone in the parking lot, but she could see an ambulance attendant cleaning out his rig on the other side of the lot near the emergency entrance. No, he seemed surprised. My face hurt. Kelly gave him a firm pat on the cheek so that he would look at her. I'm getting help. Stay right here. Okay, Tinkerbell, Andrew replied. She hoped he would listen. Kelly raced to the ambulance attendant. Hey! The EMS guy looked up. Hey! Kelly repeated and pointed back the way she had come. I need you and a gurney over here. Soon, with the help of the EMS, she had Andrew on a gurney and back to the emergency room. Exam room six. He has multiple stab wounds on the back and one to the face. She helped transfer Andrew back to his original bed, grabbing scissors to cut off his shirt when she was interrupted by Sandra. Kelly, Sandra said, come with me. Kelly looked at the team of nurses and the doctor who were with Andrew. He's my patient. Now, Kelly, Sandra's tone was firm. Putting down the scissors, Kelly stripped off her disposable gloves and followed Sandra. Ed, the emergency room security, followed them to a quiet hallway. Kelly, you can gather your things from your locker. Ed will see you out, Sandra said. You're firing me? Kelly asked in shock. I'm letting you go, yes, Sandra said calmly. Why? she demanded. You left the property. We discussed what would happen if you left during your work hours again, Sandra sighed. This shouldn't come as a surprise. My patient was outside, bleeding in your parking lot, Kelly's voice rose. What was I supposed to do? Patients are allowed to leave voluntarily at any time. We are not a prison, Sandra stated. He didn't sign out, which means the hospital would be liable if he died, Kelly said hotly. Do you even know who he is? He's one of the Ramsleys. They own this hospital. I'd love to see what they do with the people in charge if he died here through our negligence, because no one would go out to the parking lot to make sure that he was okay. Kelly, I'm not debating this, Sandra cut her off. You disobeyed the rules. You're fired. Ed, please make sure she gets her things and escort her off the property. I just saved you a lawsuit. Kelly couldn't believe this was happening. I just saved your job and you're firing me. Give me your hospital badge. Kelly wiped away an angry tear and yanked off her hospital ID, slapping it into Sandra's hand. She spun on her heel and marched to the staff room where her locker was. She was so furious. Ed tried to sympathize with her, extending his apologies for Sandra's decision, but Kelly wasn't in the mood to listen. She grabbed her stuff, throwing it into her oversized purse, and pulled on her coat. It wasn't right. It was humiliating. She wanted to yell at someone and demand that Sandra give her job back. She knew it wasn't going to happen. Sandra was in a serious relationship with her supervisor, so she could do no wrong in his eyes. There was no point in taking this up to anyone higher. Kelly left through a side exit. She didn't need people to see her get escorted from the building. Ed said good night and wished her luck. Kelly burst into tears. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of Reluctant Husband. Also, please like this video. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you.